Why has Riot stopped developing cool, edgy champions? I thought the last one was Kane. I mean, Huey is edgy, depending on what your definition of edgy is. Nefiri is edgy. Like, if you're talking about, like, edgy hot man, like, Viego's edgy. Uh, so, I don't know. Yone's edgy. I don't know if it's accurate to say the last edgy character was Kane. Kane is, like, one of the ultimate edgelords. That's definitely true. Like, you can't get much more of an edgelord than Kane. But, yeah. Huey is not edgy. He's cringy. <laughs> He's moody. Here's a fun question for you all. This is about counters and counter picking, which make balancing games even harder, okay? Someone said it in chat and it made me think about it. Someone said in chat, hey, Ramus top should be goaded, right? Because like, uh, basically you play that, everybody else in the game is picking 80 carries, and then you just roll into him and then automatically win the game, okay? So here's a funny story. Here's a funny thing to think about. Assume you balance by win rate, which you know, a lot of people would say that's the ideal way to balance the game is purely by win rate, okay? Now, assume there's a meta where everybody's picking 80 carries in every roll, and then uh, there's a couple tanks who counter it. What would those tanks' win rate look like? Assuming this meta was like very, very ingrained and like basically it was just 80 carries everywhere. What would those tanks' win rates look like if 80 carries were picked in every single roll, but there was a way to counter it and it was a number of tanks? What would happen there? They would win a lot of games. They would have very, very, very high win rates, right? And the funny part then is, who'd end up getting nerfed? Assuming you balance exclusively around win rates. And so that's one of the big complexities about balancing only around win rate and why it's more complicated that and why you have, like, it's not as simple as being like this character's win rate is high is an easy example of how win rate can be somewhat, you know, incorrect to, is when um, a character counters a meta. Because if a character counters a meta, they will look overpowered in regards to the meta. And if you nerf them in that case, what you've done is reinforce the meta. How does the balance team p uh, feel about champs with high pick rates and low win rates? Is that a success? Depends on the champ. Lee Sin is incredibly successful when he has a, a high pick rate, low win rate, because he's a character who makes sense to have a low win rate. Comparatively, Jinx doesn't make a lot of sense when she has a high pick rate and a low win rate, because she's a character that doesn't have nearly as much agency as like a lot of her competitors. So I think it really just depends on the character. Jinx is a high pick rate character that will often be buffed when she has a low win rate. Whereas that's not necessarily the case with Lee Sin because he doesn't need it in the same way that Jinx does. When I said low win rate have been below the win rate that they're balanced around. Champs like Renekton, for example, I understand are only really balanced at 48, 49. I would argue it's not a necessarily a success really ever for a character to be lower than it should be. But, you know, if we're talking about game ideals, ideally every character is in the right spot for them and that just depends on the character that's very subjective uh, what that will mean like there's a win rate that is too low for lee sin as an example so as an example with lee sin if lee sin was sitting at 44 percent win rate and still very popular i would argue that's probably not an indication of success for lee sin despite the fact that he's popular because you know some characters are just really really freaking fun regardless of how actually powerful they are right and so just because Lee Sin is super popular doesn't mean he should just, he, it's just okay to keep him at, you know, say 40% win rate, right? That said though, Lee Sin can definitely be at lower win rates than a character like Jinx and, you know, feel viable and feel powerful. As someone who doesn't watch esports, I'm often frustrated that certain things are balanced so much around pros. Do you or other developers feel similar or is it just another part of the job? Oh, I'm very frustrated when a character is balanced around pros. It definitely sucks. That said, I also have to concede that it is very important that we balance characters around pro play. And the reason for that is even though the pro players themselves aren't there that many of them, many, many league players watch and enjoy pro play. It's a very, very important part of the league ecosystem. And because of that, it's very important that pros enjoy the game to some degree. We want that. It should be somewhat enjoyable to play League of Legends at the highest level. And it's very important that League of Legends is a varied and interesting game to watch at the highest level. And so because of that, it's actually essential to League of Legends success that we balance the game for pro play. The downside of that though is it can feel really rough when a character, you know, has to just be destroyed because it's OP and pro. And so there are some things I wish, like as an example, I wish pros had more incentive to play different characters. Stuff like that would be nice, but and it can definitely be frustrating to have to, you know, bop a character for pro play. Like if you look at 
If you look at the lowest win rate characters in League of Legends for like the average player, if you look at the lowest win rate characters for the average player, um, it's basically Rengar and pro play. Rengar is because of he's really good in challenger, but then Cassanti is pro, Skarner is pro, Azir is pro, Varus is pro, Corky is pro, Aurora is new, Nidalee is a combination of pro and elite play. Tristana is pro, Callista is pro, Rumble is pro, Gragas is pro, Jace is pro, Kiana is elite. Kindred, I'm honestly just, I think she's elite now, but we just nerfed her. Aphelios is pro, right, like, I'm getting there. So, like, a lot of, like, the lowest win rate, like, hardest to succeed on characters in League are, like, because of pro play, and that can be pretty rough. That said, though, a lot of those characters at the same time, even though they're, like, low win rate, are still, like, able to succeed on. Like, you can still win on a character like Nidalee if you're really, really good. And so if I would say anything about pro, it would be like, I wish we had ways to incentivize more champion pick diversity, because the hard part about balancing for pro is pros don't pick the best characters. And so you might think, oh, when we're balancing for pro, we're objectively balancing the game, and that's not true. When we balance for pro, we subjectively balance the game a lot of times, meaning like a lot of the changes we do for pro are to make pros think in a different way. Um, it's try to like make them think about a different champion that they might want to play. And so you often have to be stuff, do stuff that's a bit detached from objective balance to cause the changes you want to see from a pro setting. Which is why I wish there was just a bit more incentive. Something like Fearless Draft for more, more champion variety. <clears throat> but yeah, I think it's very important to balance the game for pro. And I think it's like generally good for the game. Rumble is pro. Rumble is everywhere until nerfs just about now. Rumble is quite literally 100% pick ban and pro, which is why we're nerfing him. <laughs> it's like one of the big reasons we're nerfing him. There's a reason why bruiser items feel more like stats sticks than the items of other roles. Um, I can't speak to any individual bruiser item, but I'll say one thing that's really important about bruiser items is bruisers need to feel complete very quickly for their items to make sense. So what I mean by that is you need a lot to be a bruiser because you're tasked with like staying alive and dealing damage and being in a team fight and split pushing and fighting 1v1 and fighting 1v5. There's all these things you need as a bruiser to like truly be functional. And so the challenge uh, with a bruiser item is that like, let's say you force a bruiser to make a trade-off, right? You say, hey, like a really big one. You say like, hey, you're not allowed to have health and damage. You can only have health, okay? It's like, okay, um, they're gonna build a health item and then they're gonna be non-functional when they have to go to a team fight and you know put threat on an AD carry. Or they're going to build a damage item and they're going to be non-functional and they're going to have to go to a team fight and put threat on an AD carry because they won't have the health, right? And so bruiser items generally, especially their early ones, the ones we expect them to get first or second, generally need to have a good degree of like generic power that doesn't force them into like various trade-offs. Um, so Trinity Force is, his, is the historical example of this. It has health, it has attack speed, it has AD, it has the sheen proc, it has cooldown reduction, right? And you might look at that and be like, that just does everything. And like, that's kind of the point. It kind of needs to do everything. Because if it doesn't, a bruiser won't be able to function in a fight until they get to like three items. And so like early bruiser items need to be fairly like broad in what they give the bruisers. And then the third to fifth items, like the ones that they're buying last, those ones tend to be able to be, a, be able to be a bit more specialized. Those one tends to be like, okay, well now this one, uh, this is an armor item that you, a uh, mob malmorchus, you buy this to counter uh, burst, things like that. So like that's, that's kind of one of the challenges of the bruiser item system is just the things that bruisers need to function in all the ways they need to function early game tend to need to be somewhat generic. Does Riot have copyright problems with making champions before? I think the difference, oh, one thing is important. So like someone mentioned like Samira is inspired by Devil May Cry. Just because a character is inspired by something else does not mean there's any issue with copyright, right? Like there's a big difference between making a character who is stylish and making a character who's literally Dante, right? And so in games, most games take inspiration from other games or other IPs. That's just a thing. That's what that's what happens when you're a creative. When you're a creative, one of the things you do is you look at other games, IPs, experiences, and you think about like, what is the cool stuff here? Like, what are ways to adapt that in a cool way to your own game and your own experiences? Right? So copyright is always something you have to be careful about as a creative. You have to be thinking about like, you know, 
you need to be d doing things that are distinct and new. But just, yeah, noting there's a big difference between making a stylish character and, and Dante from Devil May Cry, right? Like, Jinx, as an example, has a lot of inspiration from characters like the Joker and Harley Quinn. That doesn't mean she's the Joker or Harley Quinn, 